Okay, now call to order the May 4th, 2023 meeting of the City of Nashville Planning Board. Um, Madam Secretary, can we have the roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. Mayor Donches, Mike Peterson, Scott LeClaire, Adam Varley. Here. Maggie Harper, present. Alderman Clean. Here. Dan Hudson. Here. Bob Bollinger. Here. Larry Hirsch. Here. And Alderman Tebow. Great. Thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, first up on the agenda is uh, approval of the minutes from the April 6th, um, 2023 meeting. Has anyone had an opportunity to review the minutes and uh, would like to make a motion? Mr. Hirsch? Motion to approve the minutes for the uh, April 6th meeting. Motion by Mr. Hirsch to approve the minutes. Uh, is there a second? Second by Ms. Harper. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll be abstaining because I was not here at that meeting. Uh, any opposed? Abstentions? Two abstentions. Okay. Can you hear? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, communications. Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the planning board. Uh, the following communications uh, were issued after your packets went out. Uh, case A twenty one o two ninety nine through three o two. That is the uh, Temple Street uh, asphalt project. Uh, that's a uh, email from Andrew, Andrew Perlman, attorney. Uh, the uh, second item is uh, A230020, uh, May 1st, 2023. Uh, that's going to be a engineering letter from Mark Saunders, uh, PE, deputy uh, city engineer. The uh, next, next case that came up uh, is uh, A230039. That's for the uh, proposed auto dealership at 9 Northeastern Boulevard. Uh, that's uh, Mark Saunders' letter dated April 27, 2023. The next item is the uh, A230039, uh, Notice of Acceptance of Permit Application for the AOT permit for that project, uh, A230039. Nine again, uh, that's going to be the comment letter from Hainer Swanson concerning the engineering comments that were issued in the previous letter I mentioned. Uh, then you have a couple sh sheets updated for the uh, auto dealership project. And that's it. Thank you. Report of committee and liaison. Nothing to report. Great. Thank you. Okay, before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and um, summarize the procedure for this evening's meeting. So uh, the board will first um, take up each plan and consider whether the application is complete and ready for the board to take jurisdiction. After the board takes jurisdiction, the public hearing will begin, at which time the applicant or representative of the applicant will be given time to present an overview and description of their project. They shall speak to whether or not they agree with the recommended staff stipulations. The board will then have an opportunity to ask relevant follow-up questions of the applicant or staff. After that, uh, the board will take testimony from the audience, first anyone speaking in opposition and then anyone speaking in, um, in favor. Uh, the, the applicant will be then given an opportunity to rebut any public testimony. Um, on a limited basis, after the application provides their applicant provides their rebuttal, the, the board may consider additional public testimony. After this uh, testimony process has been completed, the public hearing will end and the board will resume the public meeting, at which time the board will deliberate and vote on the application before us. We ask that both sides keep their remarks to the subject at hand and to not repeat what has already been said. We want to be fair to everyone to make the best possible decision based on the testimony presented in considering the approval criteria in the, in the ordinances. Thank you for your interest and courteous attention. I please ask that you turn off your cell phones at this time.
I'm gonna put them on silent. Okay. Old business conditional special use permits, none. Old business subdivision plans um, and old business site plans. As, as we're all aware, um, we have the four 145 Temple Street projects that were previously tabled to the May 18th, 2023 meeting. Um, in the interim, we received some additional materials from the applicant that went beyond the deadline we had established for the submission of materials. And in connection with the submission of the materials, the applicant has requested um, a further tabling of uh, this application until, until the um, June 15th, 2023 meeting uh, of the planning board. And the applicant is also requesting that we establish similar deadlines as we did when we tabled this last time um, in terms of when the applicant would need to submit materials and then when the public would need to respond to those materials. And the applicant has proposed that they be required to submit any additional materials by Friday, May 26th, um, which is about three weeks before the meeting, and then that the, uh, the public would have until June 9th, 2023, a, a week before the meeting, to submit any responsive materials to, to what the applicant has provided. Um, so we have before us then just the question of whether we would um, further table the meeting. And to be clear, ordinarily we would wait until the May 18th meeting and then determine whether we would further table. But um, in speaking with ta staff, it was agreed that it would be more efficient um, and give people additional notice if we simply <coughs> took the matter up this evening and, and considered further tabling it tonight. Uh, Alderman McLean. Uh, just a quick question. Could you repeat those dates? You said 6 9 for the public to respond? Correct. So, again, this is the proposal from the applicant. Proposal, yeah. Um, so, it, Friday, May 26th for the applicant to submit any additional materials, and then, yes, June 9th um, for the public. And I don't know what day of the week that is. I'm assuming that's a Friday, but. And do you need a motion? Uh, yes, I would need a motion. I, I will make that motion to move the tabling to June 15th with the um, applicant information must be received by 526 and the public response by 69. Great, thank you. So uh, there's a motion by Alderman Clee to further table, and sorry, I apologize, but I should, it, uh, well, you know what, I'll just do it. Um, old business A21-0299, A21-0300, A21-0301, and A21-0302 until the June 15th, 2023 meeting with a submission deadline for the applicant of Friday, May 26th, and a submission deadline uh, for the public of June 9th, 2023. Is there a second to that motion? Second by Mr. Hudson. Uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bollinger. Uh, this might be redundant, but do we also need to specify the time of day of those cutoffs? Because that, I believe, was brought up last time. Do we need to state close of business on those dates, May 26th and June 9th? Um, uh, I, if, if possible, I would suggest uh, amending uh, Alderman Clee's motion to include uh, time certain on the submission dates of Friday, May 26th and Friday, June 9th be at uh, <coughs> City Hall close of business, which I believe is 4 p.m., Sam, is that? I would recommend using 4 p.m. Okay. okay, very good, thank you. Uh, thank you. Alderman Cleave, would you be willing to amend Absolutely. your motion to that effect? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Dan, would you be willing to second that amended motion? Yes, I would. Great. Um, with that uh, motion, with that amendment proposed uh, by Alderman Cleave, is, th is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Okay, next up, new business conditional special use permits. Um, case number A23-0037, AFP 105 Corp owner, ARBI Farms LLC applicant proposed extension of conditional use permit approval to convert 13,000 square feet of function ballroom space to be used for charitable gaming. Property is located at 11 Terra Boulevard 
Sheet A, lot, one thir lot 333, zoned park industrial and located in Ward 8. And um, I am going to recuse myself from this case, which means I am going to turn over chair duties to Ms. Harper um, for purposes this, of this case. And once this case has been heard, then I will resume the chair duties. For now, I will, I will turn it over to you, Ms. Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do we have someone here uh, for the applicant? Excellent. Take, uh, we need to take jurisdiction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, would someone like to make a motion to take jurisdiction? Yes, Mr. Bollinger. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to accept jurisdiction over uh, new business conditional special use permits, case 823-0037, property located at 11 Tara Boulevard. And do we have a second? A second. Yes. Alderman Clee? Just point of order. Is that 39 or 37? I think you said 37. 30, oh, 30, I, I, 39. I, was, I was reading off the agenda. I'm sorry. Um, I would like to amend that uh, to accept jurisdiction over oh, case. No, no, no. Maybe no, it I'm is wrong. 37. Sorry. I was, I was looking at the wrong place. My apologies. Okay. It is 37. <laughs> Please disregard. That's okay. so quiet. All right. The, the original motion ahead. still stands, Madam Chair. Thank yes. you. That's Thank you, Mr. Bollinger. A second? Yes. Mm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Taking jurisdiction. Um, Thank you. Are you here for the applicant? I am, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is John Weaver. I'm with McLean Middleton, uh, 900 Elm Street, Manchester, uh, here for the applicant, ARBI Farms, LLC. Uh, the applicant received a conditional use permit for the uh, gaming, as mentioned uh, at the top of the hearing. And uh, the, uh, since then, uh, the applicant has been purchased by uh, Delaware North, which is an events and gaming company. Uh, they own TD Garden. Um, and in, during the, the transition period of ownership, there's been some uh, working out of construction issues and logistics, and so as a result, we're here to request a one-year extension to get our ducks in a row, make sure the construction is consistent with the, the goals and intent of the company. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Um, so for, I guess just generally speaking, the project still intends to move forward. It's just yes. been some unforeseen delays in the process is that a fair characterization or yeah you know, I mean or? I think I, I don't have um, say firsthand knowledge of exactly what's going on I'm outside counsel is my firsthand knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes but my impression is that um, there's the usual hiccups and logistics working out when one company acquires another and they um, you know, whatever um, ARBI farms had intended to do is probably just a little bit different given the different the differences of resources between the entities and so they're, um, they're just getting in line with what Delaware North's plans and operations are. Okay, and just a quick follow-up, if I may, Ms. Madam Yes, Chair. Mr. Bollinger, please um, do. The, the overall um, site plan that was approved at this point remains unchanged? That's correct. It's very well. All right. That was my question. Thank right. you. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No. Uh, do we have anyone in the audience that wishes to speak for the project? Do we have anyone um, in the audience or in the public that would like to speak against the project? Okay. Um, any? Oh, no, yes. Please come forward. If you could please just state your name and address. My name is Catherine Sheehan. I live at 17 Indian Fern Drive here in Nashville, about a mile and a half away. Thank you. Is this the right venue to say that you don't want the casino? Because I don't want to waste anybody's time if, it, if this is not. Yes, you may proceed. Right. Um, I've lived in Nashville for about 38 years now, all of that time being within two miles of the Sheridan Tower, Radisson, changed names once. And I've been there when it's changed. Change is good. I'm not against change. There, there are now two. Uh, strip malls in the area, the one up at uh, Sky Meadows and the new one, Tara, Tara Commons, nice. But I don't like the change right now in use and that a casino might be there. And it, look, it looks like it's going forward, but uh, some, you know, regular Joe Schmoes have to give, a, give you our opinion. So when I go and use the Spitbrook Road, which the Sheridan Tara spits out onto, 
um, especially near Christmas time, I have a lot of trouble every year. And even so much routinely is this that I even have a saying that I say to people in my car, my family, when we're going down that street, we say, yeah, it's Christmas time, just don't go out. Don't go on Spitbrook at Christmas time. Even the part of Spitbrook that is on the other side of the highway further, around from, further away from Daniel Webster Highway. And then also, later on after Christmas and after the return times have passed, there's still a lot of traffic. So I'm saying like six or eight weeks, we avoid Spitbrook, even without a casino. And the time after Christmas, when it seems like nobody should be on that road, it it's just seems to be for residences. We say, why are there so many people on the road? Because you have nothing to do in New Hampshire if you're not a skier on the weekend. So people go shopping from our neighborhood down to the Pheasant Lane Mall, which you know, I want to say something good about the Pheasant Lane Mall. I'm not against change. I was there when it was built. I've been here forever. But some change is not good. And this one is the exception to, to when change is good. Uh, I don't like the idea that even on weekdays there's traffic right there on that street that empties out um, Tara Boulevard. There, I think there's a, 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 some sort of big business down there that has to do with insurance and they stagger the people so they come out in groups. But you know it. After 38 years you know it. These are the times, you know, 4.30, 4.35 to a little after 5.15, don't be on Spitbrook Road. This is the same street that the Sheridan Tara will be using for their casino guests, the same street, Tara Boulevard. Uh, even up there on Tara Boulevard, farther up the hill, same road, more businesses are going up there. There's a new Spyglass Brewery, more traffic to be there. So it's just really scary to think what's going to be happening if we already have to avoid Spitbrook Road on the other side of the highway, the western part, um, up, up on the west part of the highway for six to eight weeks out of the year. That's a lot. Six to eight weeks out of the year right now we avoid it. How much are we going to be avoiding it once the casino goes in? It's, it's, it's unfathomable to me. And that's why I take time to be here, because if I don't complain, then I can't say later on I didn't do something. And I, I see people on the internet that complain, but nobody seemed to be here tonight, and that disappoints me a little. I, I, another thing about having a casino in, in Nashua. We already have the three, and I understand that one of the three is the one that's growing into the Sheridan Tower. Do we really need more? One town with 91,000 people needs this many casinos? I know that the uh, counter argument is that it's doing so much good, it's bringing in jobs, it's bringing in taxes, it's bringing in charity. But that doesn't mean that we should be tempted to grow this much for one city, one one area, one Sauhegan Valley, Gate City, whatever you want to call our area, that's too many casinos for one area. And I understand that the Sheridan Tower, Tower was getting a little rough around the edges and needed a development, but that temptation did not mean, need to be succumbed to to put more of a casino in there. It just, there had to be a solution, or maybe sometimes things just don't succeed, like the, the Radisson may not have succeeded, or the Sheridan Tower, what you want to call it now. Um, well, there's also the problem, and it's, I don't know how they're going to deal with it, but there are gamblers, and there are gamblers in this town. I mean, there are people who are addicted to it, and statistically, it's 1% of the population. If our town is 92,000 people, then there's 920 people out there that are going to have a tough time with a growing casino, bells, whistles, whatever their, whatever their temptation is. I feel bad for people who are homeless. I feel bad for gamblers. Gamblers are going to be coming to this place, and they're going to spend more than their spouses, family, whatever, can afford for them to spend. And that's another consideration when you decide if this really is going to go through. I, I've seen a lot of work put into this process. It seems like it's inevitable, but if there's anything that you can do about stopping it, halting it, I'm for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone else in the public or on uh, line that wishes to speak and against? against? Alice Gibson, 20 Shady Lane. 
I'll Thank you. I'll probably be repeating some of the same things, but I feel the same way. We already have Boston Billiards. People are going to have a lot of fun there until they lose too much money because it became an addiction, or for those, it could be developing an addiction. Then they can't pay their rent or their mortgage or maybe their taxes. So then Nashville won't be one of the nicest places to live in anymore. That'll be fun for the, the owners, but that's it. And I found a, a, something about living 10 miles away from a, um, a casino affects your property value. So I might ask for a reduction in my property taxes based on that. And then everyone else can do that too. Uh, do we have anyone else in the audience or online? Thank you. Um, does the representative for the applicant have any anything further? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to clarify a couple points, uh, the you know, at, kind of referencing what was said at the initial hearing last year. Um, <clears throat> so this isn't a, a new use, this is just relocating existing use on Northeastern Boulevard to the Levin Tower property. Uh, and in the six years that Charitable Gaming has been at the existing facility, there haven't been any traffic issues. Um, so we're, we're not anticipating that there'll be traffic issues now. Uh, that's an um, a intersection without a light. This will have a light. I think that that'll uh, add, uh, add safety and security there. Uh, additionally, one of the conditions of approval was that, that there would be uh, uh, cameras added to the lights there that will help the city study the traffic there and improve it. So we think this will be a, an overall net benefit uh, to the traffic that's uh, to the traffic in that area. Thank you. Um, and we're going to move from the public meeting into the board meeting. Does anyone have an, any discussion items about the case or any comments? Just in general, Madam Chair, yes. um, the board already approved this. I, I forget the exact date last year. I distinctly remember there was traffic testimony from um, a licensed professional engineer on behalf of the, the applicant. Um, personally, I would have no issues uh, granting the one-year extension um, based on the evidence that had already been heard by the board previously uh, uh, that resulted in, in the applicant's approval. Um, so with, with that, um, I would be comfortable making a motion to approve um, the extension, but obviously I'd welcome any further comments from, from other board members. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I too feel exactly the same way. There are no changes to this, it's just an extension. Um, I do remember um, discussion about traffic um, during this, this procedure that was, was going on and so on, um, and they felt that the time of day and so on could increase some of the traffic, but nothing of any significance, no more than what they were getting at the, um, at the, the Boston Billiards, and that that would be moving to uh, this new location, so uh, thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Yes, Mr. Hudson. I just want to echo the same thing, although I do uh, want to note that I appreciate the residents coming out and speaking to their uh, concerns because that's a very important part of uh, this process and in the board's del deliberation but in this case I think we've uh, heard testimony on this case previously to traffic and I agree with the other speakers that uh, at this point you know I'm ready to grant the additional year extension. Thank you Mr. Hudson. Any further discussion? Uh, if there's no further discussion, would someone like to make a motion? Mr. Bollinger. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Harper. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve new business project case 823-0037, property located at 11 Tower Boulevard, finding that it does meet the requirements outlined in site plan uh, NRO section 190-146D with no stipulations. Thank you, Mr. Bollinger. Do I have a second? A second. Alderman Clee. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes five to zero. Ms. 
Harper, would you like to relinquish the chair duties? Yes, I shall relinquish <laughs> the chair duties to you, Mr. Bartley. All right, thank you. And I will assume them again. Okay, so moving along on the agenda, um, new business subdivision plans, there are none. New business site plans, uh, case A23-0039, Nashua Motorsports Realty LLC owner, proposed site plan to construct auto dealership. The property is located at 9 Northeastern Boulevard, Sheep B, lot 237A, zoned highway business, uh, located in Ward 6. First, um, could I have a motion that this application is complete and ready for the board to accept jurisdiction? Mr. Chair? Mr. Bollinger? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'd like to mo make a motion to accept um, new business, case 823-0039, property located at 9 Northeastern Boulevard. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bollinger has made the motion to accept this case um, it, for jurisdiction, finding them is complete. Is there a second? A second. Seconded by Alderman Clee. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Good evening, Mr. Petropoulos. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, planning board. For the record, my name is Jim Petropoulos. I'm a civil engineer with Mayor Swanson, doing business at 3 Congress Street in Nashville, New Hampshire, tonight representing the property owner, Nashville Motorsports Realty, LLC. Uh, with me tonight uh, are representatives from North Point Construction, uh, Gary Thomas and Doug Turchie. Um, Al Heath is the general manager of Portia National, in case there's a, a question I can't answer. Uh, and Excuse me, sir. Could you check the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I've got to start all over. <laughs> I'll try to talk a little louder. Uh, Al Heath is the general manager, of course, of Nashua. He's with us. And I think via the interweb, Nicole Webb from uh, Praxis is the project architect, and she joins us from Atlanta, Georgia tonight. Uh, and as read into the record, uh, we are seeking a site plan approval for an automobile dealership uh, on map B, lot 237A. Uh, my role here tonight is to present the facts of uh, the project and the application and answer any questions uh, the board or the public may have. Um, Scott, if you'd be kind enough to call up the aerial. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The site in question is located at 9 Northeastern Boulevard. It's a six acre site. There we go. That should come up. Thank you, Scott. And it's zoned in the HB Highway Business District. Uh, as you can see on the aerial, the property is abutted by the FEA return pipe to the north, uh, commercial buildings to the west, Holiday Circle, which is a public street to the east, along with a daycare facility on Holiday Circle and McDonald's restaurant. Uh, and single family homes abut the property across Northeastern Boulevard. Uh, as background, You'll likely recall that this was a Holiday Inn for, for many years. Uh, their campus included a 240-room hotel, a tavern, a restaurant, a nightclub, uh, and approximately 350 parking spaces. Uh, our client purchased the hotel in 2021, uh, and after salvaging uh, most of the furnishings for charity, uh, he allowed Nashua's finest, the police and the fire, to perform training inside the building, uh, which was very nice of him to do. Uh, but the building was in very poor condition, uh, and it was uh, becoming uh, unsafe. And therefore, the hotel was demolished in late 2022. Um, Porsche Nashua, you know, uh, they're located just off, just off of Exit 5. Technically, their address is 170 Main Dunstable Road. And that site was designed and permitted uh, in 2001. Actually, it was the former Howard Johnson's hotel site. Um, it was also six acres in size, 40,000 square feet of three buildings, uh, 300 cars, and both Porsche and Audi shared dealerships in that location. Uh, due to the success of both those dealerships, 
um, uh, they're kind of bursting out of the, out of the seams there. And so uh, Porsche had been looking for a site. They wanted to stay in Nashua and were able to fortunately find this site on Northeastern Boulevard. Um, this property, as you can see on some of the maps, it is a corner lot. Uh, it currently has three curb cuts on Northeastern Boulevard and one at the cul-de-sac on, on Holiday Circle. Uh, and you can, it's a very visible site if you travel by Northeastern Boulevard. It looks flat, but it's actually about nine to 10 feet of grade change from the front of the site towards the highway. Uh, the utilities needed to service this development are located in the neighboring streets. Scott, if you could go to the next slide, please. Sure. So what's being proposed is a partial two-story building that measures 52,825 square feet in size. Uh, the dealership building will include sales and display area in the front of the building, offices on the second floor, a parts area, service bays, wash bays, and a photo booth. Now a little bit about this operation. Typically, uh, it's anticipated that this facility will see about 25 service vehicles per day. Okay, it's a fairly low number. People go in in the morning, drop off their car, somebody picks them up, they come back later in the day, grab their car. They see maybe five to seven customers, new customers looking at vehicles. The dealership receives new cars about three to five times per month. Or very infrequently, a car hauler will come in and deliver vehicles. And the facility will have approximately 50 employees. The hours are stated on the plan, Monday through Thursday, 7 to 7, Friday to Saturday, uh, Saturday 7 to 5, and then Sunday occasionally for the last day and Sunday they sometimes have a special event uh, for, for Porsche uh, aficionados. Let's talk a little bit about the site plan. As you can see, we've reduced the three curb cuts on Northeastern to two and one access off of Holiday Circle. Parking for a dealership is usually, it's kind of unique. It's a little different than another retail user uh, because they have a number of different ways in which they use the paved areas. They use it for customer parking, employee parking, service and parts parking, vehicle display, which is generally located in the front of the site, vehicle storage, and several other spaces, including 10 EV spaces that are located in the northeast corner of the site. Uh, the staff report identifies the EV spaces being open for the public. I would like to clean up the record on that. They are, they are for Porsche, uh, Porsche customers and for this dealership. Um, other elements to the application, open space, uh, we slightly exceed what the Holiday Inn had before us. 20% is required, we're at 24%. Uh, our site plan set, Mr. Chairman, includes landscaping plans, new lighting plans, uh, there'll be new poles throughout this site, uh, LED type lighting, full cutoff luminaires. Uh, the photometric plan shows no spillage onto any abutting sites. Uh, during normal business hours, there'll be full effective lighting, but after business hours, um, the lighting will be reduced to security lighting, which is about 50% of the, the normal lighting levels. With regard to stormwater, uh, National Land Use Code Section 191.15 requires applicants for redeveloped sites to improve drainage to the, quote, maximum extent possible, unquote. Currently, this site, <coughs> the Holiday Inn site, and it's all its pavement drains into a city drain line on the north part of the site and out into the city system without any qualitative or quantitative treatment. Uh, we're proposing to use curbing and catch basins to capture our runoff, bring it into three subsurface infiltration basins located throughout the parking areas, and then one surface practice in the northwest corner of the site. Uh, the overall result is that we significantly reduce the peak flows leaving the site and we add qualitative treatment and attenuation of stormwater where none currently exists. Um, a professional engineer performed a traffic uh, assessment, really comparing the dealership numbers to uh, the hotel use. And what they found is that the uh, anticipated trips uh, are less than the existing hotel and therefore further study is not warranted. 
Um, Scott, the next slide is an architectural building elevation, I think. Okay. Give you a quick sense of the building. Uh, it's a flat roof, 34 feet in height, fixed glass windows, architectural metal panels, uh, and it's got the Porsche branding of its sign and its color scheme. Uh, I call it a more modern version of the Porsche dealership at Exit 5, uh, which was built, uh, like I said, 22 years ago. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have asked for four waivers in a formal letter on April 19, 2023. Uh, waiver one was relief for surveying a thousand feet around the site. I think that's been a common waiver for site plans. Uh, waiver number two was to section 190, 198. Uh, your maximum number of parking spaces is 212. Uh, we're showing 297. As I mentioned in my presentation, parking is, is more than just customer parking. It's all those different elements. And, um, you know, Porch is purchasing um, more land because they want to keep their vehicles on campus. Uh, we've seen a number of auto dealerships in Nashville over the past five years have to go out and purchase or rent land and have satellite for inventory. Um, Porsche prefers to keep that all here on their site, so we're seeking that relief. Uh, we're asking an architectural waiver. Um, the National Land Use Code architectural waivers, I think were written for a specific building in, in type and size. Um, this building would not comply because we don't have pitch roofs and some of the entry criteria uh, would not comply as well as some of the exterior building materials. So we, we've asked for relief there. And then lastly, the code requires internal parking aisles, islands for every 10 spaces. We have two instances, three instances on the site where we could add interior islands. What we've opted to do is have larger end cap islands. Uh, so we, in fact, have even more green space in the parking lot, but uh, it just helps with snow maintenance and, and traffic uh, management. Uh, in case you're wondering, uh, the hope is that construction would start in the summer of 23. Uh, and it's approximately a 12-month project to complete. Uh, in summary, Mr. Chairman, we believe the application conforms to the land use code. Uh, the conditions of approval as outlined in the staff report are acceptable. Uh, we respectfully seek your approval this evening. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Um, and if I can't, uh, maybe members of my team can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions. I, I know you're requesting the parking waiver. Refresh my recollection. Did you say there were 300 odd spots currently associated with the, the prior Holiday Insight? Or yeah, there was. I think the original Holiday Insight had 300, 350 spaces. Right. So it would be a net reduction in yes. the prior. Yeah. Great. Um, and this is just a very minor detail, but just more out of curiosity than anything. I, I again, related to the parking aisle waiver, it, I think I'm looking at this right on the plan. It looks like three of the four sort of oversized um, islands there have plantings and then one doesn't. I just wasn't sure if there was some, if there was a specific reason for that. Uh, we do have some underground stormwater in some of the parking areas and maybe okay. underneath the, the island, and, and so it's not really conducive to, to plant a tree. Right. Application. Okay. So could be it. All right. Um, other questions from the board? Alderman Klee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for this information. My, my question, again, is about the uh, parking. I, I know that the Holiday Inn had 330-plus. Um, you said that... Um, you're, you're expecting 292, um, and that the standard obviously is 212, but um, of the 292, very few of those will be customers. What is, what is your expectation of customers and employees? Yeah. So we actually, on that drawing right next to you, uh, we actually broke down, it's up on the board. Yeah, I have it here too. <laughs> I went old school and posted one right here. Alderman? Right oh, here. there, yeah. okay, sorry. <laughs> So I did, I did identify those numbers, I, and I'm going to work off the top of my head. I believe that customer parking is about 16 spaces. Um, we have employee spaces of 50 spaces to satisfy the employees. And as I said, um, dealerships use their paved surfaces much different than a supermarket. You've got a person 
who's dropping off their car for service, usually somebody's picking them up, sometimes as a loaner vehicle, but you know, they'll go park in a parking spot until the person comes out and then they'll leave. And then when the car's done, they'll bring it out to a parking spot. So there's um, car, car parking for the service area. Um, and then of course display. Uh, I think we identified the display is right. around 70 spaces, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's what I read there. And 60, then we I have think storage it was. primarily in the back. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to represent and break down all the different uses on the plan. And I appreciate that. So basically we're looking at 50% of those would be more moving vehicles in, out type thing, employees, customers, and so on, where the remaining of them are just going to be the, the cars you have for sale or display. Yeah, yes. I would actually, yes, you're about right. Half will be active spaces, the other yeah. half will be vehicles parked there. Okay, that's, thank you very much. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Arbor? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, could you tell me um, how deliveries are going to come to the site, like on, on a large truck, and where those would be coming in on the site and to deliver those vehicles? Car deliveries? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just so we did provide in the drawings a turning movement of a car. I saw that, yeah. yeah. So what we did in the mic, he said. Oh, sorry, Jim. It's, it's, it sounds like he's having he needs trouble to getting. step up to the mic. <laughs> Maybe just you grab it off the there. Off if you want. Sing us a song. You can take the mic off if you need yeah, to. Yeah, I get screwed up when I do that. <laughs> yeah, I, feel like I talk about I feel like here. Tony Bennett, you know. I, <laughs> um, you're welcome. So uh, the anticipated route would be a car hauler would come down Holiday Circle, mm -hmm. go around the back. We've provided ample area behind the back. He would park here. They would unload and offload their vehicles here and then he would leave around the back building and come out in this location here, back to Northeastern, and presumably back to the highway. We think that's where the majority of those car haulers. Three to five per month for car haulers. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hirsch? Uh, yeah. There's reference to a future building. Is that yes. planned? Is that part of this? Um... Yeah, thank you. Thank you, I forgot to, to include that. We are representing in the northern part of the site a future building. Um, the, the uh, Nashville Motorsports Realty LLC um, believes there's a little bit of, of surplus back there that um, they're toying with the idea of maybe a, an indoor storage of vehicles. Uh, many Porsche owners like to winterize their cars indoors, so they're thinking there may be an opportunity to build a small building where uh, inside uh, there could be storage of vehicles through the winter. Yeah. Uh, obviously, any new future buildings will need to come back to this board for review and approval. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Oh, Mr. Bollinger. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Uh, um, Mr. Petropoulos, in, in your May 1st response letter to the city, there was some discussion about having additional discussions regarding the impact fee computation. Has that been has that been addressed to all parties' satisfaction? Uh, and I don't know if Mr. Hudson would like to chime in on that directly as well. I believe it has. I believe okay. um, that the agreement was for $10,000. Again, um, we're, we're less traffic than the... No, uh, under, understood, and that's why I was interested to see how that discussion yeah. turned Mr. out. Mr. Um, Hudson had a compelling argument about ex existing traffic <laughs> equipment in the area needing a little, a little bump, so. Okay, uh, understood. So thank you, thank you both. So I think that uh, you were gonna speak yeah, to that, Mr. Hudson, but. Uh, yeah, I was gonna address that. So um, yeah, I'll echo what was, uh, what was described, I mean, uh, Initially, Mr. Husband in his comment wasn't giving any credit for previous traffic uh, generation, uh, which was, you know, that's typical if we have a business that hasn't been in business for a while, you know, maybe over two years or so. Uh, I don't know exactly when the holiday went, went out of business. Um, so we, we agreed to uh, grant, you know, partial credit for the previous use, uh, recognizing that we do have needs on the corridor and throughout the city for, for maintaining and upgrading uh, our signal system. So we do appreciate um, uh, the applicant being willing to uh, make that contribution. Very well. And I, and I would just characterize the other comments in the letter um, from 
uh, Mark Saunders, Deputy City Engineer. There's various things, uh, nothing of major uh, concern to the engineering department. And um, uh, HSI has made a resubmittal. We just haven't had time to go back through that, but I'm sure that they have, have uh, adequately addressed everything or will be able to um, do so uh, in the near term. Very well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Well, sir, now. Is there anyone in the audience uh, wishing to speak in opposition or concern to this plan? I do. Oh, sorry. Yep, I was going to go to Zoom next. So. Okay, um, thank you, Howard. Yep, so not seeing anyone in the audience, I'll, I'll go to Zoom. So um, please go ahead if you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Sure. My name is Jenny Santiago, and I live at 12 Northeastern Boulevard, directly across from um, where they're planning to put this dealership. And I have, I have two concerns. Uh, first concern is at the end of Holiday Circle, to the right is a daycare. So my concern is with these big trucks coming down that street, um, you know, I'm hoping that they can put some barriers there so that trucks aren't, you know, you know, with snow and ice and rain that, you know, I want to make sure that that daycare is protected in case, you know, car slides or whatever, one of those big haulers or whatever. Um, it, that has me really concerned. And also that there's no waste or anything being dumped near where that daycare is because I don't want the kids to be affected um, by any kind of fumes or, or gas or anything like that. So that's worrying me that, you know, nothing, I don't want any chemicals or anything in that area. And then also my last concern is that um, when North Point was tearing down the hotel, there was a lot of shaking going on in my house and I have a lot of cracks in my house that I didn't have before. I've only been living here for three years. And as many times as I called North Point to tell them, stop shaking my house. And um, I called them and told them, there's all these cracks in my ceilings now, which have not been addressed by them, even though I've called them several times, left messages, you know, let's get this resolved, let's get this fixed. I don't care if you send your own people to come and fix these cracks, but no answers whatsoever. So those are my three concerns, mostly for the daycare. Um, so I'm hoping that they can uh, address that, or somebody can. And that's all I got to say. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that's on Zoom that was uh, wishing to speak in opposition or concern? Not seeing anyone. Is there anyone in the audience or on Zoom wishing to speak in favor of the plan? Okay, seeing no one, Ms. Petropolis give you the chance to respond. So <laughs> I think it was the, the truck turning radius near the daycare, the waste disposal, and I guess I would ask you to just address that generally in terms of, you know, to the extent that there's, you know, uh, repair work being done, what is the proposal for, for waste Best, disposal? Thank you, uh, Ms. Santiago, for your comments. I, I'm, I'm not really seeing an issue. There's plenty of room in Holiday and plenty of room at the cul-de-sac. Um, I thank her for her, her safety concerns. Here's the daycare here. Uh, but I don't see any issues. It's a fairly flat section of road, so it's not a steep um, uh, gradient uh, for those vehicles. Um, and again, they will park and get into the site and offload their vehicles into the site. Um, with regard to waste disposal, the dumpsters enclosed are located along this side of the property right here, which is about as far away from the daycare as we can get in the back portion of the building. Um, there is no real waste disposal on that side. Uh, reused tires are within the building. Uh, but I did learn we have a small little outbuilding right there, and, and that's for uh, used batteries. Um, and so there'll be a separate enclosure for used batteries, and that will be a fully sprinkler little shed there. So sometimes you see these battery fires on TV, and um, you know the, the, the folks at Porsche have thought about that and put that in. Uh, with regard to vibrations, I'm not sure exactly 
what that was. No easy task taking down a 50-year-old four-story hotel. Um, but I'm sure North Point, as they uh, begin their construction of this facility, um, they can reach out to the neighbors. Uh, generally, uh, they would want to do that uh, if there were any blasting, which we don't think is the case here. Uh, there could be some, uh, some rollers to compact earth, but that would be over a fairly short period of time. So um, I got a feeling that there'll be less of an impact maybe than the demolition phase in terms of operations. Sure, so, so nothing going forward in terms of the construction that you would anticipate as of right now that would exacerbate any of those Correct. issues. Correct. So those would be my responses. To and then just uh, the one of the sort of like waste component, you know, to the extent that there's oil or other fluids, I'm assuming that there's a standard process like any re very, auto repair processes yeah. on handling of, you know, waste oil and things like that. That's all within the main building. Yeah. Okay. Other questions from the board? Alderman Klee. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman. The the shed for the batteries that you you mentioned, obviously they don't stay there forever. Um, sure. How often will they be picked up and moved? And do you know? Yeah, that any I of that? don't know. <laughs> within 24 hours of notification. Yeah, okay, so a day or two. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, so with, within a day or so they'll be yeah. moved, thank you. And again, that's an enclosed building and it's a sprinkler building. So. Right, I was just curious, I just didn't want to see that only once every six months or something, yeah, right. when you can no longer fit another one and it gets right. moved, but right. to know that they'll be moved right. pretty regularly, that's good, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, any other questions for the applicant, the public staff, before we close the hearing and go into the public meeting? Oh, sorry. Good evening, Paul Morey. I live in Hollis, 164 Hayden Road. I own some property in Nashville as well. My only question on the batteries: uh, EV vehicles batteries may consider may pose different problems than lead acid batteries. So you guys may want to think about whether or not you're going to put any requirements on that aspect. Okay. Just a, just a thought. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if yeah, we want to clarify just as to the disposal, uh, whether it would be standard car batteries versus, uh, I'm assuming it would not be an, an EV. I'd like to thank the gentleman for uh, making that comment. Um, Al tells me that they're all, as I mentioned, picked up within 24 hours. Uh, there's standard rules that a dealership's got to follow, and certainly Porsche will follow those, those rules, whether it's a, a traditional car battery versus a lithium battery. So, so in, in, but it would be the it is, it is possible that it could be lithium batteries from an EV, but it, it, there's, there's some, whatever guidelines exist, you know, they would. Everything would be done in accordance with the, the regulations for those batteries, yes. That, that would be my testimony, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant on that or anything else? Okay. With that, I will um, close the public hearing and uh, now enter the public meeting um, where we can discuss the case. If there are any comments, thoughts, anyone who wants to add? Seems like a relatively straightforward application for the most part. We do have the few waivers, um, but, but generally fairly standard. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, in terms of the, the sort of fit for the site, um, we've got your know, testimony that, you know, the, the traffic will be, you know, less than, you know, the, the, the prior use and understanding the sort of the issue in, in terms of the, the, the gap between the prior use and, and this nonetheless. Um, and, you know, the applicant has now agreed to the $10,000 traffic impact fee um, and generally seems like some improvements overall to the site uh, relative to what was there certainly what 
what was there after the you know hotel was no longer existing. So um, generally seems like a you know a, a positive improvement. And I think the applicant has you know, addressed a few concerns that were raised. So um, I would put it out to anyone if anyone has any questions or concerns that they don't think we, we've addressed. You know, let me know. No, I'm happy um, to take any comment questions. Mr. Chair, I would just echo I, I, I think that. Um, Obviously, the hotel had seen better days um, by eliminating one of the curb cuts on Northeastern Boulevard. I think that's that's a net positive, as well as um, they talked to at least some extent about the uh, the traffic. So I, I see this as an overall you know improvement as as to what was there. Um, so um, and I, I would be comfortable moving forward, um, you know, with a motion. On this, on this case. Thank you, Mr. Ballinger. <clears throat> Anyone else? Mr. Hudson? Um, just a couple of suggested edits to the staff uh, recommendations and findings. So number five, um, the uh, comments provided by engineering were in a letter from Mark Saunders, Deputy City Engineer, dated 427, 2023. Um, and then number six, I think we could just modify that to be a payment of $10,000 would be made to the nearest traffic quarter fund without reference to Wayne Husband's uh, uh, separate communication with Wayne Husband because that was part of the engineering letter, uh, which, which obviously staff didn't have the benefit of seeing at the time they drafted the comments, so no fault of theirs. Um, so so with those, uh, those would be the edits I would recommend. Any other questions, comments before I take a motion? Mr. Bollinger, do you want to go ahead and make that motion? Um, certainly, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve new business case 823-0039, property located at 9 Northeastern Boulevard finding that it does meet the requirements outlined in Site Plan NRO Section 190-146D, subject to 12 conditions. Um, the first four conditions are regarding waivers, um, specifically Condition 1, the request for a waiver of Section 190-279EE with respect to existing conditions uh, shall read is granted and will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Condition number two, the request for a waiver of NRO section 190-184D with respect to parking aisles shall read is granted and will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Stipulation number three, requesting a waiver of NRO section 190-172 with respect to architectural standards shall read is granted and will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Stipulation number four shall, uh, excuse me, stipulation number four, request for a waiver of NRO section 190-198 with respect to number of parking spaces shall read is granted and will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Stipulation number five shall be amended to state prior to the chair signing the plan, all amendments in a letter from Mark Saunders, deputy city engineer, dated April 27th, 2023 will be resolved to the satisfaction of the Division of Public Works. Stipulation number six shall be amended in the staff report to read, prior to the chair signing the plan, a payment of $10,000 will be made to the nearest corridor fund as listed under item 17 of Mark Saunders' above letter on behalf of Wayne Husband, senior traffic engineer. Uh, stipulations 7 through 12 as written in the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Bollinger. So we have a motion from Mr. Bollinger to approve new business A23-0039 with the 12 stipulations as indicated. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Ms. Harper. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs>
Thank you. Next up on the agenda is new business site plan case A23-0020, G. Hurd and Son Construction LLC owner proposed site plan to construct four single family condominium units. Property is located at 976 West Hollis Street at Sheet D, Lot 509, zoned suburban residence and located in Ward 5. As to case A23-0020, uh, is anyone willing to make a motion that this application is complete and ready for the board to accept jurisdiction? Mr. Chair? Mr. Bollinger? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to accept new business, case number 823-0020, uh, property located at 976 West Hollis Street. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bollinger, for that motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Hirsch. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Is there someone here from the applicant? Good evening, Chairperson, members of the board, planning department professionals. Thank, Thank you very much for hearing our application this evening. My name is Colin Jean. I'm an attorney here in Nashua. I'm here on behalf of the owner, G. Heard, and Sun Construction. The applicant, Tuckney Heard, and Clegg LLC. Here this evening with me is uh, Michael Granger from MJ Granger Engineering, currently putting up a copy of the plan on the board. Also here this evening is uh, George Heard from the G Heard Sun Construction, and Robert Clegg from Tuckney Heard and Clegg LLC. Uh, the applicant uh, seeks from the board this evening. Uh, permission to erect or construct four single family condominium style uh, residences on a 3.15 acre parcel of land, map 00D0509. This property is located on what is generally sometimes called Old West Hollis Street. It's a small loop off of West Hollis Street uh, with uh, the general area uh, has single family homes, a lot of manufactured housing, uh, also has a uh, number of condominium developments in the general area. Uh, the applicant uh, believes this fairly modest four unit request uh, meets all of current zoning, will meet all setbacks, and comes this evening with the request for three waivers. Now the first waiver is for existing uh, conditions, 190.279 EE, sidewalk requirement 192.112 D2, and lighting plan 190.279 N. Uh, the waiver requirement which requires existing conditions uh, would be repetitive in nature as there are going to be really no, there aren't going to be any real changes to the existing conditions that would change the nature of the property because uh, there was no previous use for it. Waiver from the requirement to install sidewalks on West Hollis Street frontage uh, I believe has been addressed and given the fact that there are no sidewalks in the area right now, the applicant is certainly willing to make a contribution to the sidewalk fund. And the final request for the lighting uh, waiver uh, is going to be addressed by having uh, non-intrusive lighting at the entrance of each house and at the end of each driveway by way of a, a, a light bulb, you know, a standard lamp, basically, for a residence. The property is going to be serviced uh, by public water and private sewer. The, obviously, as a condominium, the owners will be responsible for maintenance of the property. It will be serviced by a private driveway, and each resident will have off of that their own driveway. If there are any questions relating to the plan itself, uh, Michael Granger is here this evening. Uh, if there are any questions relating to uh, the intent of the developer to go forward on this, I believe you've also received as part of your package uh, a rendering of what the proposed uh, residences look like or are proposed to look like, which are very standard housing. 
be happy to entertain any questions you might have. So uh, you, you may already be aware of this, but if you're not, um, we re did receive a comment from Anna Butter, yes. um, Ms. McClellan, and she had written to inquire whether the developer would be willing to consider uh, fencing at the rear of the property. I'm not sure whether that's something that you've had the opportunity to consider, whether it's something you've discussed with the owner. Um, but just wanted to get your thoughts, response right. to that I, I, consideration. I, the owner has not made a decision regarding fencing. I know that the, the back boundary that abuts this McClellan's property is going to be well bounded with markers. Uh, there's no change in the outlay of the property, so there's no change in the existing bounds. Uh, I know that over the past years, uh, the abutters property was well wooded. It is now cleared so that you know, fencing, I could see where it would be uh, somewhat more advantageous to have that, but anybody can put a fence up. So while the owner of the property isn't opposed to fencing, I think it's something he'd like to be able to discuss with the abutter to decide, geez, if fences make really good neighbors, why don't we discuss it in terms of the type of fence that's going to be there, how it's going to be erected, who's going to erect it, and who's going to provide the funding for it. So it could very well be that in the end, uh, given the nature of the property as condominiums, that there will be fencing there. But at this point in time, he has not made a decision. Okay. Thank you. Um, no. Sorry. <laughs> Who wants to go first? It was just a follow-up to your question, Mr. Chairman. All right. So, I, Alderman Klee, is that okay if we start with that one then? Uh, yeah. That, I have a follow-up to yours. Uh, but all I right. Just, <laughs> by all means, go. Mr. Pollinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, apologize uh, That's okay. for cutting off my colleague. Uh, I did just want to point out, I just did a quick scale off the city GIS. Um, it would be about a 375 foot fence. Uh, there's quite quite a bit of shared property line uh, between those two properties. Um, so I, I understand why the applicant would want to discuss that. It's not you know, kind of your standard you know quarter acre or smaller lot where you're talking about a much smaller fence partition. But I just wanted to point that out for the benefit of uh, other members of the board. Uh, so thank yep. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bollinger. Alderman McClee? Thank you, and uh, mine isn't quite about the fencing. It's more to her comment about the um, leach fields and the um, public sewer and so on. Um, I think her question was, which one will it be? It's going to be public water, Penichuk, and private sewer septic. That's a okay. typo, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think I, sh I should have noted this because um, Scott had identified it. There is a discrepancy. I think the staff report um, had incorrectly referred to city sewer. Right. That that's what I was a little confused of myself. Yeah. So thank so, you. So, but the, yeah, we I think that everyone's cleared out. It's okay. um, it's private sewer. So. So it, it's private sewage and but uh, public Penichuk water. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions for the applicant? I'd also just like to note that uh, I think we received the engineering department's notes Tuesday morning, so they haven't been incorporated into the final plan yet, but they will be, and they're all accepted. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, and just actually while you're up, did I, in, I don't have, I just, there was, Dan, am I right that there was a consideration for a, a traffic impact fee here as well? Um, I just wanted, I, I figured. Don't, I doubt it, being only four units. I'll review the letter here and double check. You know. I just figured if, if. But I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure given, given that scale of development that there wouldn't be. Let me, let me just verify. Number 11. I can let you know that there was no, there was no amount listed. So I took it to mean there was no amount, but certainly yeah. open to hear. Okay. Yeah, there, Dan, the reason I ask is there's a, there's a condition, condition number 11 in the staff report oh, okay. that refers to a blank contribution. Yeah, I think that could be struck. I mean, we've, we've kind of have an internal guideline, uh, you know, about five or less units doesn't, doesn't trigger a contribution, something like that. So, okay. yeah, this is, this is a small enough scale that there wouldn't be one. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. 
So I think no other questions for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there, um, is there anyone in the audience uh, or on Zoom wishing to speak in opposition or concern to the plan? And I'll, I'll take the members who are sitting here physically first. Uh, so please just come forward, um, state your name and address for the record. Okay, thank you. And we can have the applicant address both those issues. You can just please state your name and address for the record. Yes, the name is Paul Mori. I'm a co-owner of Butter. And I, am I addressing, can I just bring up another, another issue or are we addressing only her issue at this point? No, no, yeah, you, you can speak to anything that's related to the okay. application. Uh, boundaries are important, as we all know. And I think that's an issue that... Uh, the previous speaker was addressing. And currently, the boundaries uh, that I abut, the one that's on the street, the old Holler Street, and the two bounds that make the corner behind the property are marked with pipe, you know, driven pipe. Uh, when I had it surveyed, that's the way the surveyor marked it. I, I'd like to make a request, if I could, it, that uh, those be marked with a granite, concrete, whatever, permanent in-ground pipe that can't be moved readily. Um, they serve a purpose that we're doing here. They, they were able to find them, I'm sure, when they bought the property and whatnot. But I'm asking, let's get this defined, and I think that's part of her concern, so that people don't encroach across it. And, and just, sorry, the, the markers that you're referring to are on your property? They're the boundaries between the property. My parents own the entire lot. Myself and my sisters and spouses owned it before we subdivided it. We subdivided the property into the 974 lot, the 976 lot, and up the street where the, the uh, church is across uh, about 1015 West Holler Street. So here there are three boundaries, markers that are common to my property and his property, and there's a fourth boundary which be in common with uh, Marie's property at the very far back side of the property. And I think we ought to get those permanently signed or located. Finding a par uh, boundary out there is nearly impossible. You're going to know what you're looking for. But that would obviate any issues later on. You know, maybe we could put a small fence post every 50 feet if we wanted to mark the boundary that way. I mean, I, I could do that myself if we have two permanent markers, you know. So that's what I'm addressing on that. The second issue I'd like to bring up is runoff. Uh, the Lyle Brook out there is downhill from the properties. This property is not much above the elevation of the high water level of Lyle Brook. I believe that's what that brook is called. And uh, I do not know 
what the, the state stipulations or requirements have controlled runoff are, but that would be a concern of mine, uh, what's going on there. Sorry, in, in, are, are you speaking to concern about runoff coming onto your property? No, I'm talking about runoff into the brook, because I'm, I'm slightly uphill from what they've got to deal with. Uh, but their property downstream, it's going to naturally run in that direction, especially if there are any houses on the west side of their drive entrance, especially those. Okay, so you're talking about on the subject site? On the subject site, that's correct. Yep. Okay. That's all I have. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience uh, wishing to speak in opposition or concern? Do we have anyone on Zoom? Um, hi, yes. Uh, oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead. If you could just uh, state your name and address for the record. Sandra Lopez, and we live in 980 West Holly Street. Um, we just bought the property um, last year, not knowing that there was this going on. Um, but uh, the question here is that if you see the map, we're like right next to it. And um, so I, we have like, a, I don't know what it's called, um, when they, they gave us access for our driveway because they own the property. Um, so the question is, I don't, um, we're gonna still use it without any problems or driving that is already existing. And also, um, since the houses are gonna be facing our house, because we're on the back, are they planning on doing or putting up any fence? Um, because uh, their, the houses are not gonna be, like their, back, their backyard is not gonna be to us, but um, just for privacy. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, anything else? No, that's all. Okay, great, thank you. Is there anyone else on Zoom? Wishing to speak in opposition or concern? I think so. Okay, with that then I would ask the applicant to come up and address the, the issues we've identified. So we've got the, um, Ms. McCollum, who's again, who, I guess more specifically identified the the particular section of the property that she's referring to, um, asking asking about uh, potential um, you know I guess runoff uh, flooding issues with respect to the to the septic, similar concern um, from from the other butter, and then the the question about the boundary markers, and then um, I think the 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 resident 980 had, again, a question about fencing, but then also I think a, a question about the, sounds like there, there may be a, an existing easement for the use of the driveway. So if you could speak to each of those. I'd be happy to address the uh, easement issue, the Zoom callers issue. Uh, when this property was subdivided by the Morgan back, so, back, yeah. back in the 1980s, back in the 1980s, they gave, the owner of the manufactured housing that is 980, a, an exclusive easement for the use of the way into their property because their, their land was landlocked. Uh, after endeavoring for, let's say, 18 to 24 months with three different owners over the course of the time with that property because it's been sold a number of times over the past three, three or four years, uh, it was decided that the owner of the property really wanted to keep the exclusive way because our proposal was to add on to that way and then split off so there'd just be one driveway in the property. So we had to get uh, a variance, which was granted for the use of a separate driveway at the other end. Uh, so to answer the question as, as economically as possible, they have an exclusive use of that easement and no one else can use it without their permission. So that's not an issue. With, with regard to the fence, again, I'm gonna fall back on the same thing as that we really haven't made any determination regarding fence. As I understood it, the houses that are being proposed would be set back quite a long way from where their residence is. 
because they're on, I think, on the far western side of the property. And I think the houses are more or less on the eastern side of the property, if I'm looking at it correctly, or if I'm recalling it correctly. With respect to the uh, septic runoff and uh, rain runoff and water runoff, I'd like to defer that to uh, our engineer, Michael Granger, who's probably far more adept at answering such a question than I am. So with your permission? Yes, please. Michael Granger, MJ Granger Engineering in Hudson. Uh, with respect to the uh, leach fields, the water table out there is uh, two and a half feet seasonal high water table, so we're going to be raising those fields up another three or four feet to finish grade. And that's going to be approved by the city health department. I've already spoken to him about that and the state of DES, obviously. Uh, drainage wise, we've got a drainage report that was stamped and approved. You guys, uh, your engineering department looked at it and uh, we're stopping all the drainage basically and building a retention pond to hold it as required. Uh, we're not doing any construction between the private drive and Lyle Brook except for that drainage, uh, that drainage basin. And that was the part of the discussion with Conservation Commission. So we're going to stay as far away from Lyle Brook as we can. So hopefully, everybody can. Yeah, and, and sorry, if you could just clarify, certainly not an area of expertise for me. The, the leach fields, you're saying they're, they're, what is the construction there in terms of in relation to the water sorry, table? I, can't, I couldn't understand you. Uh, I'm, I'm saying you were describing the construction of the leach fields. I'm saying what what is what is it you were describing in relation to the water table there? How how is it? The, the water table out there is between two and a half and three feet in the ground already. Mm -hmm. the requirement for the state of New Hampshire is four feet separation from the bed bottom of the leach field to seasonal high ta water table. So we're already going to raise that up a foot minimum, and then there'll be two feet over that. So basically three feet higher. And if you look at page five that uh, Scott's got up on, on your, you can see the, uh, oh, he had it up. It's still there. Which is the, the driveway, the private drive road profile. Looking for the retention pond? Right there. Okay. And the bottom dotted line is uh, the finished grade. And you can see how much we're raising it up once we get down to where the houses are. You know, it's uh, roughly four feet the road will be raised up. Okay. It, and just to, to clarify that the, the one about I raised the issue about the, the current boundary markers, the, the, I'm assuming there wasn't a, survey, a new survey done? Here. I surveyed it, yes. You did, okay. Yes. I'm a licensed surveyor in uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Okay. I've been out there. And, and so you just, you, and, but there was no, there were no new markers placed? Uh, yeah, there were actually uh, new markers on almost all of them. I think it's the only the only part that there uh, there aren't new markers on is what uh, Mr. Mori was talking about is up front uh, near Unit One. Those two markers are not in. And during construction or when we're done, I, I have to put those in. And anyway. I'm sorry. I will have to put those in. You will put them in. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Any other questions for the Appen's attorney engineer? Oh, hold on just a moment. Um, just want to make sure. It, were there any other questions? Okay. Is it Mr. Morey? On, on the septic design, uh, my private residence has a similar issue as far as the elevated issue uh, where the leach area itself is minimum didn't meet the minimum requirement they build up. Uh, are they going to have a clay barrier on the downhill side so you don't have horizontal runoff? I mean, that's a stipulation that the state put in in mind when I was having mine done 45 years ago, okay? Uh, and I didn't have a brook there, but I mean, if you build up, you really have to have a barrier on the end. 
and I like to ha have that made sure. Otherwise, you, the water doesn't leach down, which is going to go out the side of the hill, and you've got the problem into the runoff into the Lyle Brook. So, if nobody's addressed that, I think it needs to be addressed. That's an ecological situation. You, know, you, you got to stop that from going horizontal. The reason you need distance for, for the for the drainage to go down through the leach field is because soil naturally filters and holds back for uh, degradation of whatever's in the, the runoff. Yeah, so I, I, I'll ask. My name again once is Paul Murray and <laughs> Hayden Rowe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll ask the applicant. I, th I think what the, what the applicant uh, testified to was that you know that that obviously the, the leach field development construction would be consistent with any applicable you know uh, regulatory standards. But I'll, I'll have him address that. Okay. Michael Granger again. Uh, back in 1970s, 80s. I think is what he was talking about. The state required a clay barrier. You put your septic system in, and then there was a five foot or 10 foot width of solid clay, or as thick as they could. So they, you know, no stumps, no that kind of stuff. So that the water, would basically the effluent, would drain down through the soil. They've discovered that that's not the right way to do it. They got rid of the clay barrier in the mid 80s maybe 90s, somewhere around there. And now it's a three foot sand barrier that lets the water trickle down and go at a 45 degree angle. And on the side, on, on one of those, uh, on sheet six, I believe, or sheet four, no, probably sheet six, it shows uh, the finished contours and they're at a three to one slope from the leach field itself it's a three to one slope so the water can go on okay. before it gets, and that filters it and cleans it out. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Harper? Uh, so just, I'm just trying to picture the, you know, pr picture the property. So essentially in the, in the front yard of each of these units, there's going to be a, a hill or a raised area for the septic fields? Or is the yes, whole the, lot? Yes, the, there'll be a drive under and into the side of that is the, the lawn coming out straight and then it'll be a slope, a three one slope towards, oh. the, towards the private drive. Oh, okay. thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? I have a question. Oh, uh, sorry, hold on. I, <laughs> so I will, ordinarily, the, just to be clear, the process is, you know, the applicant testifies as to their plan, we, we take testimony from the public, the applicant rebuts, and then we generally don't have, you know, for that. I will make an exception because there's only a few of us, but, but just I, I do want to sort of keep it confined here um, to, to just what the applicant has, has spoken to now because I, I think we've covered the septic issue um, and, you know, the stormwater management. So. Well, I just wanted to, could I ask the builder, um, will the condo association be um, taking care of the septic? Pumping and that for the um, people who live in the homes. Yes, and I have them confirmed. I believe that was what was testified to already. But if if the applicant just wants to confirm that. I can't tell you definitively that that's been decided because it may be. It, sorry, it, it may be that uh, the final condominium declaration will dedicate exclusive space to particular residences in which case each resident would be responsible for their own exclusive space. The condo association would be responsible for all of the common area. If the entire parcel remains common area, then yes, the uh, condominium association would be responsible for the maintenance. But it so it, the, the bottom line is it would be one, it would either be the individual residents responsible for their own systems or it would be the condo association responsible for all of the systems together. Correct. Yep. Right. And when I spoke earlier saying that the condominium association was responsible for the maintenance, I was talking about this, you know, removing snow from the street, maintaining the common areas, things, whatever they end up being. But obviously if someone has dedicated area of 16,000 square feet per their condominium D, then they take responsibility for that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Nope. 
Hold, okay. <laughs> Mr. Hirsch, and then all of them include. Uh, just, a, just a quick question. Do I understand that you're raising the entire lot or just the, the uh, septic system area, the leach area? Because I'm a little bit confused by what's happening there. <laughs> Are you raising the entire the grade of the entire property, or just where the septic systems or leach fields are? The, the road what? will be roughly four feet higher than it is now because of the water table. The road the water road? table is only that down down that far, so we can't put our foundation in any lower than that. I see. No, so from there it'll be eight feet up, and that'll match the front door and where the leach field is. Okay, so basically the entire lot will be right. great. Okay, Correct. thank you. Uh, Alderman Klee. Uh, thank you very much, and I hate to beat the, the dead horse. I know it was addressed about the association versus the individuals being responsible for it. Um, I, I would just like to, to clarify that. Uh, I am, I'm a ward alderman, and in my ward, we had um, a similar situation where a, a, a complex was kind of built and then um, they had these kind of fields and sewerage system that they had to take care of and it got neglected. And then the city has to come in and, and take care of it so, um, or condemn the homes. <laughs> so I just wanted to be very clear that regardless whether it's an individual or an association, that this is very clearly stipulated, that very specific thing that they are, whether it's to have it um, um, looked at on an annual basis or you know, on a regular type of basis, I, I I don't. It's been a long time. I used to live in Chelmsford, I, so I used to have one of these. But it's been a while since I've had to deal with it. But I know that we had to get it checked on a regular basis. So I really would like something like that in there. And I'm not sure if that's within the planning board. I kind of got my alderman hat on right now. And, well, I, and I yeah. think you make an excellent point. And I can tell you that it is going to be it is going to be clearly delineated in in the articles uh, what the responsibilities are and what they aren't, and who is responsible for what. Because that's the only way these things are going to work out long run. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant or anyone else while we're in the public hearing? Okay. With that, I will close the public hearing um, and enter the public meeting for us to um, deliberate on the uh, on the plan. So, uh, you know, again, I, I think you know, such the the couple of issues we, we spend a little time discussing um, a, a fairly straightforward plan. Um, I I think you know the the couple of technical points um, in terms of exclusive access to the driveway and the. The, the leach fields I think I think we've covered um, you know obviously the, there was there were a couple of um, you know questions requests regarding um, fencing I think to mr. Bollinger's point given the given that we're not talking about um, a, a, you know a relatively modest sized lot but we'd be talking about you know at least several hundred feet of fencing I personally think it's reasonable to you know, leave it to um, the, the the abutters to sort of have discussions about that and maybe determine what's appropriate. You know, particularly where we've got um, you know consistent uses abutting one another, and and you know, um, and so I, I, you know, my view is that that would be appropriate to sort of leave that to the applicant and the abutters to to discuss that and determine what would be appropriate. Um, and then I, I, I did just want to clarify, it did sound like the applicant indicated that they would be putting the additional um, boundary markers in. So that addressed one of the other concerns raised by Mr. Morey. And then finally, just for anyone who's making the motion, just a reminder that um, you know, Mr. Hudson indicated that we could remove stipulation number 11. So um, with that, uh, other questions, comments from the board? Uh, thank you very much. Um, in, in regards to, to fencing, I, to me, there's all types of fencing. There's natural fencing. There's actual fencing. Um, it looks like there was some forestry that was removed. Um, 
I would love to see. Um, I, I once lived in, in Canongate, and one of the things when we had our new boundary, uh, our new neighbors come in, it was uh, clean manufacturing, but we asked for, you know, some kind of, of tree line. Um, they put up arborvitaes type of thing. Half of them died, but um, they, uh, but they, they, they did do something like that. So I think if, if conversations could happen between um, the abutters and so on, whether it be real fencing, natural fencing, or something, just to kind of, um, it does make good neighbors and it, it looks nice on both ends, especially natural fencing. So thank you. Any other comments, questions from the board? Would anyone like to propose a motion? Um, Mr. Chair? Mr. Bollinger? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I would like to make a motion to approve uh, new business, case number 823-0020, property located at 976 West Hollis Street. Finding that it does meet the requirements outlined in NRO section 190-146D, um, and that would be conditional upon 15 stipulations. Um, stipulation number one, regarding a waiver of NRO section 190-279EE and B with respect to existing conditions shown on the plan shall read is granted and will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Stipulation number two, regarding a waiver of NRO section 190-279N um, with respect to lighting plan shall read is granted and will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Stipulation number three is a waiver request of section 190-212A1 regarding sidewalk um, and that shall read is granted will not be contrary to the spirit and intent um, with the specified contribution uh, in lieu of, of $5,100. Uh, stipulations four through eight as written in the staff report. Stipulation number nine amended to read uh, prior to the chair signing the plan, all comments found in a letter from Mark Saunders, deputy city engineer dated May 1, 2023 will be resolved to the satisfaction of the engineering department. Uh, stipulation number 10 as written in the staff report uh, stipulation 11, as written in the staff report, shall be stricken. Uh, next enumeration, uh, new number 11 through 15, as written in the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Bollinger. So um, we have a motion to approve new business A23-0020. Um, from Mr. Bollinger with the, the 15 condition stipulations as indicated. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Mr. Hirsch. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes unanimously. Okay, um, next up on the agenda, we have uh, other business item number one, review of tentative agenda to determine proposals of regional impact. Let's see. Do we have a tentative agenda? I, I, I didn't see one. I didn't Mr. See Chair, in the packet. Yeah. There was. I didn't see one. Yeah. There was there, none. There was none. Okay. okay. In that case, um, I think we can dispense with Item number one, uh, because there is no tentative agenda. So we'll move to other business. Item number two, referral from the Board of Aldermen on proposed amended ordinance 0-23-051, amending the land use code regarding the application of the sign article to government signage and the approval of sign permits through the site plan review process. Mr. Sullivan. Good evening, members of the board. Matt Sullivan with the Community Development Division. 
I'm here on behalf of the ordinance request before you relative to how the uh, treatment of government signage is done within the city of Nashua. Uh, before I get into the details of the proposal, I want to just take a, a step back quickly and, and outline a provision of state law and the way that it's applied within the city of Nashua relative to how governmental uses are treated generally across the state of New Hampshire. Uh, RSA 67454 by default uh, exempts any governmental use from uh, being uh, applied to by the municipality's land use code in any way, shape, or form. And what that means is that provided that something is a governmental use, the zoning ordinance and the site plan review regulations and the subdivision regulations do not apply to that governmental use. However, uh, many municipalities in the interest of trying to demonstrate the principles that they've actually codified within their ordinances have actually decided to adopt their local ordinances and try to follow them to the, the maximum extent practicable. Uh, Nashua has been one of those communities. Within the land use code, we have decided that whether it's signage or minimum lot size or the regulations that come before you as part of a new public works facility, we need to fully comply with those regulations. There are a few exemptions that exist within the ordinance as it, as it exists today. Uh, one such exemption is actually in the sign code and says that governmental signage is exempt from sign permitting. But what it doesn't say is that governmental signage is exempt from the sign ordinance generally. And so what that means is that uh, whether it's a, a sign at the uh, outside city hall, it's a sign at the transit center, uh, or it's a sign posted for public informational signage along the right of way, but on off of the, uh, the right of way itself, that is fully subject to the municipality's ordinances. And the result of that has been that several, or, several signs that could not comply for one reason or another that were displaying public informational signs have actually gone to the zoning board and sought a variance. Uh, fortunately, I don't need to come to this board and explain what a variance is. You've had a direct experience with the variance criteria, whether for good or bad, as part of recent applications. Uh, and so you know that there are five criteria to a variance that must be uh, found in favor by this board or by the zoning board, as it were, in order for a variance to be granted. One of those criteria is, and the most challenging criteria, I would argue, and perhaps the least well-defined criteria, criterion, is the criterion of hardship. Uh, and what we found, particularly with municipal, municipal signage, is that signs presented to the zoning board that are intended to convey a public message have a very difficult time meeting that fifth criterion under New Hampshire state law because they, there isn't necessarily a hardship of the property per se or a specific unique situation, but in fact there is a recognized public benefit to the signage that's being proposed and it may not be injurious to uh, the intent of the ordinance and it may be respectful of the character of the neighborhood, but again that hardship criteria becomes very, very challenging to meet. However, despite that municipal signage may not strictly comply with the hardship criteria, uh, our zoning board, I think, has applied a, a lens of reasonableness when considering governmental requests. And all but uh, just a few variances that have been, been applied for by the city for signage specifically have been granted, in fact. And so there are many signs across the community uh, that, in fact, did seek variances to the zoning board and were, were uh, granted those variances as well. However, through further conversation, both with some members of our internal team and, and some folks outside as well, particularly those within the departments and divisions across the city, this variance process has been challenging, uh, and the needs of the city are very dynamic when it comes to signage. And that's not to say that we're going to construct you know, large billboards that say, you know, Dan Hudson is the best city engineer, or that we'll do you know, any other signage that is not generally compliant with the ordinance. But sometimes we need to move very quickly and in a way that is not fully compliant with the zoning ordinance. Uh, or perhaps the zoning ordinance does not fully contemplate what the municipality is trying to do at a given point in time. And so what I'm really saying is that I believe that the municipalities should be treated in a different way under our sign ordinance particularly. But I don't believe it should be fully exempt. Uh, therefore, I began working with Alderman Dowd on an exemption, uh, or I should say a modification to the zoning ordinance that provides a, a, a slight level of exemption to municipal signage moving forward that is not able to comply strictly with the sign ordinance as it exists today. The exemption that I'm referring to uh, would still maintain a, a zoning board process for signage that cannot comply strictly with the ordinance. It would still include a public hearing that would allow the public to comment on, on any signage that's proposed that does not comply. It would still involve public notification, and it would and still uh, would involve the need for the zoning board to actually grant an approval after considering a set of criteria. However, 
rather than using the variance criteria and particularly having to deal with that very challenging fifth hardship standard that uh, is a bit challenging for the board to apply, particularly when there's a case of clear public benefit, what I've proposed here working with Alderman Dowd is to actually use the special exception criteria, uh, of which there are four primary criteria here in the city of Nashua, that reflect four of the five variance criteria, but again, not that crucial hardship one. It does respect the fact that a sign needs to be in character of the neighborhood and respect the integrity of the, the zoning ordinance that is generally applied in that area. It has to not be injurious to public health, safety, and welfare, of course. And all of those findings need to be made by the zoning board. Each one of those findings need to be made in order for an approval to be granted. So before you is a request to amend the ordinance for signage that cannot comply with the, with the city's land use code and the sign ordinance to put it through a special exception process at the zoning board rather than require a variance as, it, at the, as the process is laid out today. There is one additional amendment beyond simply that modification to the process, and that is that currently, uh, and I hesitate to say this in public, but I've already, I've already let the cat out of the bag, if you will, the, the Board of Aldermen, we currently have what I would call sort of a, a weakness or a hole in our ordinance that's existed for some point in time. Um, it's not been clearly taken advantage of, of any, by any applicant to this board, uh, although you have seen some signs of this type, and that is that the current ordinance reads that if a sign is shown on a site plan that's approved by this body, whether or not it complies strictly with the ordinance, if the board approves the plan showing that sign, then that sign is deemed approved, whether or not it complies with the zoning ordinance. And so you're functionally potentially exempting a sign that does not respect the character uh, of the zoning ordinance in which, in which it exists, all through the site plan review process. So what we're proposing here is to strike that language, and therefore uh, this body would lose its ability to grant non-conforming signage a functional variance through the site plan review process. Uh, but I would argue that was never the intent of that language, uh, nor is it really the role of the planning board to be granting that kind of relief to the underlying zoning code. So I think this removal is highly appropriate. So again, two pieces. This site plan review exempt, this site plan approval exemption for signage is being removed. And then we are changing, making a process change that would not change the way the sign ordinance is written or the way it's applied, but would instead change the process through which a sign has to go in the event that it cannot comply with the code and is being proposed for a governmental use. Uh, with that, happy to answer any questions that the planning board might have. It, Matt, just one question. You mentioned sort of generally the type of issue that the city runs into in, you know, in the current process and trying to be hard. Is there, do you have just like an, one example of like a type of sign that the city would be utilizing that they would currently have to go through the, you know, the variance process that, that might then go through the special exception process, process now? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm, I'm glad you raised the issue because there's been some very open conversation about uh, an alternative intent of this proposal, and it just gives me sort of an opportunity to address it. Uh, there are currently some signs being proposed in, in several locations that are electronic, electronic messaging signs, so sort of the, the changing letter signs, digital signage. Uh, that's certainly something that the city has, has sought to adopt in more locations uh, as part of its development of new facilities such as the middle school and the DPW facility. So I think electronic messaging signage is certainly something that might be subject to the special exception process. However, historically, it's actually been signs that have changing letters that are manually changed that have been granted exemptions or granted variances, rather. And there has al have also been some minor signage allowances as far as height, area, relative to ground signs associated particularly with the school district. Uh, there have been several of those granted over the years. Uh, I wouldn't call those trends, per se. We have about 15 or so of these that have been variances that have been granted over time. Uh, I, again, I wouldn't call those trends per se, but I think sort of the emergent things are certainly electronic messaging, uh, and I think anything with changing messages that allows the municipality to more dynamically respond to what the public might need to hear, that's what I think is really going to be going to the zoning board for a special exception. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Mr. Sullivan? Alderman McClee? Oh, excuse me. Thank you so much, and thank you for taking this, this question. Um, the first question is, I will bring up the DPW. Um, in, 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 the, in the past, we've had temporary signs there that have had messaging and so on. They did not need variances. Is that correct? 
Yes, and the reason for that is that signage, it's important to distinguish signage within the right of way and signage on private property. Obviously, or not obviously, I shouldn't say that. Uh, the zoning ordinance does not apply to signage that is within the public right of way. That's actually under the, the purview of uh, the Public Works Department and the Board of Public Works uh, through an encumbrance permitting process. And so the, the orange construction signs that you've seen, those are typically located within the right of way. And that's why they do not need to seek a variance nor a permit. And I think I just lost the question I had. <laughs> Excuse me. Come back to me. It'll come back to me, honestly. It's Thank happening you. to all of us. Oh my God. <laughs> don't, don't feel bad. It was like I, right there. <laughs> well, while Alderman Clee is trying to recall her second question, does anyone else have any questions? Please. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, yes, I do remember it. It was, <laughs> thank you. It was, it was kind of a question that I had mentioned to you before. Sure. I told you when I lived at Canningate um, and the mortgage company before they went off <laughs> um, had, yes. had moved in and it was the very first time I've ever spoken in front of the zoning board and I was not a member of the aldermanic board. Um, we had concern about signs changing too fast mm -hmm. um, because it created um, an issue where we were getting hit from behind when we would try to turn into to that. Um, so that, that was my only concern. Will these signs, these municipal governmental signs, however, still have to conform to, I, I think, at least back then, the conversation was they couldn't change any faster than um, uh, traffic signals. So it, it, would it still have to conform to something like that and, and so on? The, the answer is absolutely, and I'd, I'd make a couple comments. The, perhaps the worst thing that happened in the city of Nashua for electronic messaging signs is the, the mortgage specialist sign, obviously, <laughs> along Amherst Street. I think it's put us several decades behind when it comes to approving uh, what can be variable, a very reasonable type of signage in the community. And when I say it can be reasonable is that you can control the frequency. You can control the lumens that are used. You can ask for the sign to be turned off during certain hours of the day. Uh, the one thing I can offer, and I can't commit our divisions or departments to anything specifically, but I know that for folks that are exploring electronic messaging signage, particularly on the governmental side of the house, they are going to work very closely with the zoning board if they do need to request a special exception to put reasonable accommodations and rules in place that are respectful of the context of the sign to avoid the very problem that you're referring to, Alderman McLeod, because certainly uh, the municipal signage should not be distracting it should not create an unsafe condition. Uh, lending back to sort of that injurious uh, you know, criterion that I think needs to be considered. Uh, so I think the governmental entity is going to be very responsible and, and keep in mind the fact that electronic messaging signage particularly uh, can, be, can be very problematic in that way. Um, I guess the only other comment I would make, just to be clear, that private signage is not being impacted at all by this amendment before you. This is only applying to governmental uses uh, specifically uh, within the city of Nashua. Just one quick follow up. Oh, go ahead. Th th thank you so much. Um, and, and this type of signage, like public notice, is, is for the public. Um, it's, it's for the city to be able to get information out. Um, I, I have no idea what kind of, what kind of but for like the school, so the, the new school or something like that, to say um, report cards are out or I, I see it in, when I drive through Chelmsford and other, uh, other cities that they put up these, these kind of signs to let parents and the public know that something's going on there and so on. It's, it's, it's for public information is yeah, I'm kind of asking. I, I think it's important that I, that I make sure I'm clear about okay. that. And, and the answer is that if the sign is being erected in relation to a governmental use, then that is what puts it through this alternative process of special exception should this language be approved. Now, to get to the nuance of your question, in the event that something is shown that is not strictly public informational in nature, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, and I can't really write this second, but I'm not sure that would strictly violate the zoning ordinance per se, uh, but I guess the, the, what I would offer is that the municipality is highly unlikely to be doing advertising, obviously, and so I think, it's, I, think I do want to be clear that we would not be doing that, but it's possible that something may be posted uh, relative to an event happening in the community uh, that may have some sponsorship of some type by, type by a nonprofit or something to that effect. 
I don't want to rule that out because that's really a content-based regulation that wouldn't be strictly governed by what we're talking about here. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, um, Matt, I think I just thought of one that might fall into that category. Uh, uh, Amherst Street, traveling eastbound, right at the Somerset Parkway, Nashua PD will often put up a sign, you know, recruiting or exams yep. taking place. So I don't know if that, I'm not trying to muddy the water, I'm just throwing it out there. That, that Maybe was, in the public right of way, not sure. <laughs> it's a very narrow median, so I don't know, but okay. uh, I, nobody's hit it as far as I know. But, okay. um, but uh, th that wasn't even my, my, my real question. I, I buried the lead. Uh, when you use the term governmental use, does that include all governments? Like we have United States Post Office, yeah, we have state of New Hampshire facilities. Uh, yeah. Does it, it does. Okay. Uh, and so I want to be clear, this is not just about city signage. It's everything that's provided the exemption under RSA 67454. Uh, so we're talking about a variety of different governments. Okay. Yes. Good, good okay. question. Okay. It also applies to the college and university system uh, of the state. And so, yeah, that's a great question, Mr. Bollinger. Okay. Great. Thank you. And, and Matt, just one other point of clarification. You, you noted that you, you said there's, this is not impacting private signs at all. But just to clarify, the the provision that that's proposed to be removed from the ordinance about yes, thank you. That 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 obviously I'm assuming that is not limited to government uses. That would be any site plan. Right? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. That yep. that's absolutely correct. I should say that the special exception amendment is not impacting private signage. Right. The removal of the provision that allows signs via site plan that does impact all okay. forms of signage. Great. <clears throat> thank you. Other questions? Okay. So um, it's then up to the board here to make a favorable or unfavorable recommendation as to the change. Um, it seems to me that, in my view, both these changes seem perfectly reasonable. Um, I, I think given the, the nature of the signage that the, the city utilizes and the particular point that you and Mr. Sullivan made about the process it certainly seems reasonable to to create this limited exception for, for the for governmental uses, and then I, I to be honest, I was not even aware that there was that that exception in terms of you know approval within the site plan. So I think that's a I, I think that's actually a very good idea, a very good change, um, because I, I think that you know the plan board probably was not even aware that we could have potentially been. Improving non-conforming signs in that way. So, um, seems to me both good changes, and I would certainly be supportive. But would like to hear from others. Alderman Cleet. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and and I do want to address the um, the the removal of that approval by the the planning board. I I can see a variety of different things would happen from being in the historic district to um, and if we approved a site plan and it didn't conform to the historic district, as you said that. Um, this this could end up becoming quite an issue. So I'm, I'm glad you found this and I'm glad it's being struck. So thank you Okay, would anyone be interested in making a motion on this then? Um, Mr. Bollinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to make a favorable recommendation um, regarding the revisions to ordinance uh, 0-23-051 uh, back to the Board of Aldermen. So motion by uh, Mr. Bollinger to make a favorable recommendation on ordinance um, 0-23-051. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded. Seconded by Alderman Clee. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes unanimously. Okay. Any discussion items? Okay. I would uh, take a motion to adjourn in that case. So moved, Mr. Chair. Motion by Mr. Bollinger to adjourn. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. And we are adjourned at 8.59. Let's get it in on that right. <laughs> End of the hour. <laughs>